Hello and welcome to the Cyber Underground. I'm your guest host today, Jeff Milford. Today we're going to be talking about bitcoins and we have our guest, Kevin Doherty. He's an expert in bitcoins, among other things. Kevin, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Hi, my name is Kevin Doherty. I'm with uh, T3 Information Security Services. Uh, I work with some of Hawaii's uh, most regulated industries, uh, helping them uh, from an information security perspective. Excellent. Thank you. Full disclosure, I used to work for Kevin as well. Good. Um, so tell me a little bit about Bitcoin. Let's uh, talk about where it started. Yeah, so Bitcoin um, was sort of a byproduct of the 2008-2009 financial meltdown. Um, basically, some papers were published online that uh, espouse the need for a currency that's not tied to any sort of uh, financial regulator, um, and that began um, the idea of digital currency or cryptocurrency, as it's now called. Um, what Bitcoin is, uh, in its most simple, simplest form, is digital money, really. Um, it's, uh, it's a peer-to-peer -peer system. What that means is if I want to send money to you, I don't have to go through Visa, I don't have to go through uh, a bank, I don't have to go through PayPal, I don't have to use Western Union. I can simply send money directly from, in one example, my phone to your phone mm -hmm. without any third parties in the middle. Um, what that does is it's, it, it makes for a very fast system uh, it's also cost effective. There's very low fees, uh, generally speaking. Um, it also allows you to send money anywhere in the world. Um, so, you know, uh, if you're trying to wire money overseas, many, many people have found that that is an onerous process and also it can be very expensive. Sure. <clears throat> so, excuse me. So, um, what Bitcoin does is it allows you to send money very quickly um, for. Uh, you know, inexpensively um, to anyone, anytime, anywhere. Um, okay. So it doesn't sound like it's very highly regulated. It sounds like, as you're saying, peer to peer. Um, obviously, banks have or um, a lot of regulations about the amount and the uh, maximum amounts, um, kind of the owner's part that I think you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I would say that that varies country to country. So China recently has announced that they're, um, they're, they are definitely regulating Bitcoin, uh, uh, for example. Uh, the U.S. announced just yesterday, as a matter of fact, the, the, Fed, vice, the, the Fed vice chair uh, nominee said that you know, the Fed is keeping a very close eye on Bitcoin. Um, and, and that's actually good for Bitcoin, to be honest with you. Right now it's in a nascent stage. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty from, a, from an investor's perspective or even from a, a user's perspective. There's a lot of volatility um, and there's, um, there's some, you know, uncertainty is not good for any kind of a financial instrument, right? And so there's a lot of uncertainty as it, as it pertains to Bitcoin and regulation moving forward in the U.S. So, um, you know, most advocates will say that um, some... Uh, regulation could be good for Bitcoin mm -hmm. over the long term. Um, what, we're, what we are seeing more and more um, with large banking institutions is the adoption of what's called the blockchain. Um, and just, this gets a little wonky, so okay. bear with me. Um, but blockchain is a technology which Bitcoin is based upon. Okay. Um, and really what blockchain is, it's it's um, what's known as a, a distributed database. It's, um, it's a secure ledger where um, everybody, it, everybody can see it, but everything within the ledger is very, very secure. Okay. So, um, so by, uh, by distributed database, you mean it's not all in one place? Right. It exists in different places. That's right. And so um, the neat part about blockchain is that uh, the way that um, it, it prevents fraud is that because it's so transparent, there's all these third parties constantly validating um, the data within the blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very difficult to, um, to, uh, to hack it or to modify it or in any way affect the, the integrity of the data on the blockchain. 
Um, so because of that, I mean, it's good for cryptocurrency, but it's also got a lot of other uses, right? Mm -hmm. So um, big banks are looking at using it for many, many um, applications and new features. Um, the internet itself uh, is starting to adopt blockchain for things like online gambling, which is admittedly not so great, but um, for VPN usage, for mm -hmm. distributed file share systems. Um, so blockchain is, is, is real exciting, and it's really going to change, I think, in the next five to ten years, the way the internet works. Um, but back to Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is based on blockchain. Um, one of the things you're also seeing now with Bitcoin is, uh, and, and anybody who's looked into this will, will attest that a mind-boggling number of what's called altcoins. Um, and alt means alternate, mean, meaning it, they're derivative coins of, of, of Bitcoin. Bitcoin was sort of the original, and then there's a lot of other derivative coins, thousands, actually over a thousand now. Um, and that causes a lot of confusion for, for people who are trying to use or adopt the technology or even for investors. Um, but uh, it, it, it's, um, it's important to be aware that they're out there, mm -hmm. but in fact that they are in, you know, derivative of, of Bitcoin itself. Okay. The Bitcoin, if I understand it right, has a certain value at any given time. Mm -hmm. And it seems from talking to people that that's gone up significantly over the last couple of years. So is there an investment side of the Bitcoin where you, you might want to hold on to them? Yeah, so that's a great question. So there's really two reasons anybody, uh, two primary reasons that anybody would buy Bitcoin. Number one is to use it from a trans for transactions, mm -hmm. um, like money. Um, and then the second reason is to buy and hold for an investment vehicle. Um, so. Uh, we'll talk about the transactions first. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of sites online now that actually accept Bitcoin. So um, Newegg, Tiger Direct, um, let's see, uh, Overstock.com, you can buy airline tickets with Bitcoin, wow. CheapAir.com. Um, and, and that number is actually expanding. More and more sites are looking at um, accepting Bitcoin as a form of payment online. Um, Amazon, as a matter of fact, is considering adopting Bitcoin uh, wow. online. And by the way, like the Bitcoin community is pretty excited about That's that. That's like the, the stamp oh, of approval. It'll be huge, right? So it hasn't happened yet, and I, I, you know, there's some theories about why it hasn't happened. I think it will happen, whether it's Bitcoin or their own um, alt currency, mm -hmm. um, you know, Amazon coin or whatever they're right. going to call it. Um, but they, I, I think that eventually they will um, adopt some sort of cryptocurrency as a form of payment. Um, so that's pretty exciting. And, and you know, from an information security perspective, uh, as a security engineer, I can tell you that um, what we're doing on the internet right now isn't working. Mm -hmm. So anytime you want to make a trans, you know, uh, initiate a transaction online nowadays, and you want to use a credit card, which mm -hmm. is basically your only option at this point. Um, you're required to provide name, address, phone number. So you have to provide all these details, these personal pieces of information, mm -hmm. just to go buy, um, you know, a sponge uh, on on a, on a website. Right. Um, and what that does for the average consumer, whether they realize it or not, in the in the in the age of the data breach, mm -hmm. right? Which you know, open any newspaper nowadays. There's another one, another uh, one. Uh, you know, on display. What that does is it increases the exposure for the breach of individual consumers' private information mm -hmm. every time that happens. So every time you buy something online at a new um, uh, site, right. you're, you're potentially increasing your exposure to data breaches, right? Um, what I personally am excited about is changing that paradigm um, moving forward. Um, when, you, when you begin using Bitcoin online for transactional purposes, the only thing that's required is for you to send money to the address. Mm -hmm. They don't even need to know your name. They don't need to know your address. They don't need to know your phone number. None of that. Um, so that right there, I think, will be incredibly helpful um, from a privacy perspective um, moving forward um, mm -hmm. into the future. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, you talked about the buy and hold, right? So actually, even in the last couple of weeks. Um, Bitcoin, I think, has gone up almost 90% in two weeks. 
Uh, it's over, it's at about $11,000 a coin today, um, which is unbelievable, right? And so a lot of people are seeing this and they're excited about it and there's like this, they call it the fear of missing out, right? And so there's a lot of retail money piling into Bitcoin um, for buy and hold purposes right now. Um, it was just announced today, as a matter of fact, that the, the uh, SEC approved um, the futures trading for Bitcoin on the Chicago Board of Exchange, CBE, I think it's called. Um, so that's going to um, open it up for institutional money to start piling into Bitcoin. So from an investment perspective, I, I believe, you know, it, it, there's no doubt it's, it's a speculative investment, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's very volatile. People should know that before you get into it and definitely do your research. Uh, and you know, just understand that whatever money you invest, you should be, uh, you know, comfortable losing if if it goes to zero because it's it could. I don't think that's going to happen, but it is possible. Right. Um, so it, it, I think it's going to get interesting um, as we move forward. Uh, it looks like ETFs are going to be approved on um, on other exchanges, uh, Bitcoin focused ETFs. So I think with all the institutional money starting to pile in, um, that it'll probably reduce the volatility quite a bit, um, which will actually be good for Bitcoin in the long term. But what's interesting is, you know, they, they compare Bitcoin to gold, right? Because gold is a commodity that we can't make more of. We can't right. artificially go create gold, right? There's a, a finite amount of supply mm -hmm. and as demand increases, obviously the price of the commodity is going to increase. Bitcoin is very similar, maybe people don't understand this, but there will only ever be in circulation 21 million Bitcoins. There will never be okay. more than that. So it, it, there's a finite supply of Bitcoins and as demand rises, the price of the Bitcoin will rise, right? Um, so I think from, a, from an investment perspective, that makes it interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I think that makes it interesting is that it's fairly um, what they call untethered from other markets. Um, so, you know, it's not really, there's not a lot of um, correlation between the price of Bitcoin and like the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones, right? Okay. Um, so those are companies and this is a commodity, right? So there's not a lot of correlation and so a lot of people are thinking that this is going to be a, a safe haven in the event of any kind of market uncertainty. So that could be interesting. Okay. And you use the term ETF, electronic transfer funds? Uh, that's actually exchange traded exchange fund. Exchange trading. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's like, um, sort of like a mutual fund. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like a lot of this is um, legitimizing it, Bitcoin in, in people's eyes. It, I think so. I think that it's become mainstream. Um, you know, I still run into people all the time that have never heard of it. But um, on the flip side of that, you know, I, there's a lot of people talking about it. It's very exciting. It's new technology. Um, it's it's on CNBC all the time now, so that's cool. Um, so people are beginning to have an awareness that this, you know, cryptocurrency market exists, and they're they're asking all the right questions, right? So, it's this is still very very early days for cryptocurrencies. I think 10 years from now, you know, we'll really start probably start seeing it come into its 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 stride. Okay. Yeah. Up until a few months ago, the only time I heard about Bitcoin was for the dark web, and I yeah, think that's that unfortunate. Scares people a little bit, but but we're doing a lot to change that. Yeah. So I mean, it, unfortunately, it's um, gotten uh, known for ransomware, right? right? So anybody who has ransomware, they have to pay in Bitcoin, and you know. The, the, the attackers do that because it's secure, fast, and private, right? Um, just because they use it for nefarious purposes doesn't mean that the underlying technology isn't good and, and useful for, for everyday you know, consumers, right? Okay. Um, let, let me hold up right there. We're going to take a minute uh, and do some breaks, and we'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. We have this crazy thing going on today. I was just walking by and all these DJs and producers are set up all around the city. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music. There were a lot of people that claimed they had 
had no musical talent and then sat down and kind of played some really nice sound. I like this music. Welcome back to the Cyber Underground. I'm your guest host, Jeff Milford, and today we're talking about Bitcoins with our guest, Kevin Doherty. Okay, when we left, we were talking about how most people didn't probably know what Bitcoins are. I think we've covered that pretty well, how they're in use and how they can be used. How do people buy Bitcoins? How do they acquire them? Yeah, so that's a great question and um, something that's uh, even stumped me. Uh, to, if I'm being honest, going you know years back. So um, as the technology improves, it's becoming easier and easier to access. Uh, it didn't used to be so easy. And, and in fairness, you know it still can be kind of onerous to buy actual bitcoins. Um, we live in Hawaii, and there's actually, believe it or not, two bitcoin ATMs in Hawaii. Really? Yeah. So um, Hawaii Stamp and Coin downtown has a bitcoin ATM. And Vape Kings on King Street has a Hawaii, uh, I'm sorry, a uh, Bitcoin ATM. And so the way this works is you walk up with your phone, it's got your Bitcoin app on it, you literally insert money into the machine, put your phone up there, and it sends Bitcoins to your phone. Super easy. Um, what I will say is it's not super cheap. So they, um, you know, downtown I think it's like a 22% charge to use their, their uh, ATM and uh, the King Street one, the last time I used it, was somewhere around 18%. So um, not the most cost-effective way right. to buy Bitcoin, but it is the most convenient, which sure. uh, kind of makes sense, right? Um, if you have Square Cash, the Square Cash app mm -hmm. on your phone or tablet, um, they just recently announced a new feature where you can buy Bitcoins directly from the Square uh, Cash app. Um, you can buy Bitcoins directly from people, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if I wanted to buy Bitcoins from you, I could give you cash, you send me your Bitcoins, and we're done, right? There's actually a site called uh, localbitcoins.com that you can go to and find people in your community that are trying to sell Bitcoins. And you negotiate the price, obviously, before you go meet them. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other uh, caution, I would, I would say, is um, meet them in a public place, right? Right. Just be... Uh, well lit. Yeah, be be smart about it. You don't want to be meeting people behind you know garages and uh, <laughs> dimly lit uh, streets. Right. Um, the uh, the best way, really, from a from a cost perspective, to buy bitcoins is to use what's called a bitcoin exchange. Mm. And so, basically, what these are are um, websites that um, you you send cash or you use a credit card, and you can buy bitcoins. Um, it's very cost effective. Um, you can, I mentioned you can use credit cards, debit cards. The best way to do it is to actually wire money to the exchange, to your account, and then you basically just buy the Bitcoins uh, using US dollars in this case. Um, you can also buy altcoins on exchanges. Um, so that's really the most cost effective way. Um, and the one other um, thing that I would mention is there is currently an ETF so if you've got an IRA or 401k or some sort of an uh, investment account and you wanted to uh, uh, get the benefit of the rise in the, the price of Bitcoins, but you didn't want to mess around with actually owning Bitcoins and securing them and so forth, you could actually invest in what's called the GBTC um, uh, fund. Uh, it's actually done really well. I, I, I've been an investor in it for some time. Um, and it's very easy, right? It's just like investing in a stock. Right. So um, let's talk about, I guess, um, you know, once you buy the Bitcoin, what do you do next, right? So um, write this down and circle it. Once you buy Bitcoins, you do not leave them or store them on the exchange. Um, you, you can technically do that but it is not a good idea. The reason for that is because exchanges have been in the past and continue to be targets of hackers. 
Sure. And there's no such thing as FDIC insured Bitcoin <laughs> accounts, right? So if your exchange gets hacked and your Bitcoin are, are um, you know, removed from your account, you know, there's, there's really not that much, there's, there's no way of getting it back. Um, in fairness, you know, all of these exchange operators, they're businessmen and women, um, they've gone to great lengths to recoup people's money um, after uh, hacks have happened in the past. So um, I think that's good, but it's still not um, best practice to leave your coins on an exchange. A better approach is to use what's called a wallet. So if Bitcoin is digital money, a wallet is like your, your software wallet that you might have in your pocket. Um, these wallets, uh, they can be online wallets, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. They can be software wallets, which you install on your, your desktop computer or your phone, as a matter of fact. Um, so what I would say is it really depends on whether or not, on how you intend to use your Bitcoin as to what kind of wallet you would, you would use. Okay. Um, if you're going to use it for transactional purposes, then you might want to have some Bitcoin on your phone. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to put all of your Bitcoin on your phone. Mm -hmm. I would use your phone wallet the same way that you use the wallet in your pocket. Uh, you don't have all the money in your savings account carrying around with you every day, right? Um, so I would keep you know, $40, $50, $100 in Bitcoin in your, in your phone mm -hmm. wallet for transactional purposes. Um, but keep the vast majority of it in a, in, in a wallet that's, that's a little bit more secure. Um, so uh, these wallets, um, the, the, the other really important thing for people to understand is that um, there's, there's things called um, keys that secure your, your Bitcoin. Uh, there's a public key and a private key. Think of these keys like the keys to your car. Whoever owns them, owns the car. Okay. So if I've got the keys to your car, regardless of what your title says, I can go drive your car off, right? So um, it's, it's a good um, practice to use wallets where you keep your own keys. Um, and so like these online wallets, they're very convenient, but the thing to understand again is that the, the hosting website actually controls the keys which makes you vulnerable to a hack. Potential hacks. Right. So not the greatest idea. Although convenient, um, not the most secure way of storing your coins. A better way is to install the software locally on a desktop. Um, keep your keys. Uh, typically what you want to do is um, a lot of these wallets, they'll use like what's called a, a, a seed, seed key, mm -hmm. which is basically like 12 words, right? So write them down. Put it in a file, on, physically on a piece of paper, um, so that um, you're not storing them in the same place that your wallet exists. Because um, that's that's the only way you can recover a wallet. Yes. If you lose those words, you're. That's right. You're done. You're done. So if if you lose your 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 keys and you lose your phone, you, you lost your Bitcoin, right? Whereas if you lose your phone and you have your keys. You can actually just install the software, put your keys in, and your Bitcoin magically appears, right? Um, the, uh, oh, so, and then I'm, the other kind of wallet is what's called a hardware wallet. Um, and what this is, is it's actually like a little USB type device with a, a OLED display on it. Um, they're typically about $100. They're very inexpensive, and they're a very secure way of, of storing your cryptocurrency offline. Um, so um, that's that's a real good option if uh, if you're worried about theft and um, mm -hmm. the security of your coins, especially if you have a lot of it, right? The right. value continues to go up. Um, probably not a bad investment to spend the hundred dollars and get a, a hardware wallet. Mm -hmm. So and that's encrypted. It is encrypted, and actually, um, it it the way that it connects to your um, computer is through what's called HID, which is getting a little wonky, but it's actually a very secure way for it to, to connect to your computer. It doesn't it doesn't mount like a storage mm -hmm. device, um, which is inherently problematic. Yeah. Um, so it they're they're very well designed, they're very secure, uh, and they're very easy to use too. So okay. well, I wanted to get back to the ATM question for a minute. So I have five hundred dollars. I want to go to the ATM downtown. Yeah. So when I put in my $500, they're going to take 
22 percent. So 110 of that goes to them. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to get $390 worth of Bitcoin. Yes. And whatever the current value is, that'll just be some decimal point. Yeah. It, so that's a good point. So so people think it's um, you don't have to um, create transactions in even numbers of bitcoins, which would be really problematic, right? At ten thousand or eleven thousand right. dollar coin, right? So they have they have uh, what's called MBTCs, which is micro bitcoins. So because there's a finite supply of bitcoins, you can imagine, especially as the price continues to increase, that basically you know you you might be doing transactions which are point zero 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 one. Bitcoin, right. right? Which is roughly about a dollar. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it scales in that you can indefinitely continue to um, trade smaller and smaller amounts of Bitcoins. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what else should people know as far as how to get involved? Yeah, well, let me let me just talk about a couple of other just general security um, principles. Um, when you're when you're using Bitcoin for transactions or even transferring it around between wallets, you should never really use the same address twice. Very easy to change addresses. You just hit create new address. Um, you should always turn on two-factor authentication, okay. um, which. Uh, will send you a text or you'll use some other form of authentication when you're logging in to your exchange account or to your wallets. Um, never store your keys on your computer. Always try to print them off. Okay. Um, yeah. All good habits to have. Yes, yes. Even outside of Bitcoin. Yes, that is true. These are generally good security uh, you know, principles. Okay. Well, that about wraps it up for us. Today, I hope you all learned something. I know I did. I had a lot of misconceptions before today, but Kevin steered us in the right direction and gave us some good info. Uh, please return again next week. I don't know whether Dave Stevens will be back or not, but I'll be back on January 5th with another topic. Thank you very much. Thank you.